Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz drummer, composer, and educator Devin Gray. These days he is living, playing, and loving the jazz in New York City, but his journey began in the great state of Maine. From there, he has received incredible teaching over the years and has gone on to play in Europe and well beyond. He just released a new 2015 album called Relative Resonance and has other projects on the horizon. He spoke candidly about his life in jazz, the cats he's played with, why he loves jazz so much, and many more things. Please, get to know Devin and dig this interview, my friends. Devin, thank you for taking some time to talk with me today. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. Looking right forward to it. Right on. Let me go ahead and kind of dive in right now. Just kind of a general view. I know you're always busy, but give me an idea of what has been going on with you lately. Well, lots of different projects, trying to manage a lot of things at once, lots of composition. Basically, I'm about to go on tour uh, in two days to Europe and play with a bunch of different groups in Switzerland and the UK and Norway and elsewhere. And then this spring, there's a lot of projects coming up. My band, uh, Dirigo Rataplan, is recording another record in June, and we're doing a residency at iBeam. So we're going to play two nights in a row and then record, which I'm really excited for. So it's been a lot of work going into composition because that's kind of what I do with that band. Um, that's with Ellery Esselin, Dave Ballou, Michael Formanek. And I'm really excited to get that group to play again and work on music together. Let's see, some other projects in the spring. It kind of blends into the summer, going to Europe with a, a collective trio that I'm in called Spaj, spelled V-A-X. And we're working with a uh, German ballet company to make this crazy kind of conceptual performance piece. Let's see, in New York also recording with a vocalist, Zach Foley. His band is recording and kind of on and on like this. There's probably a couple other things I'm just missing, but a lot of like kind of mixed projects like this are just kind of churning around. Like trumpeter Nate Woolley's project is might be coming out in early June as well. So June is pretty crazy for me at the moment. But Yeah. Well, and, and the thing you know, that always stands out to me is when you get to go to a place like Europe that embraces jazz in a whole different way than the Americas do. What's that like to know that you're going to go over to Europe and have such a great reception? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I've been going over there for years, probably over 10 years, which is kind of a lot for me at my age. So I kind of started to see it, um, you know, er early. Yeah, it it to me it's not always just jazz, but just kind of like the arts in general and, and the exposure of, dare I say, creativity in general. And that when that translates to music and oftentimes directly into jazz, it, it's pretty rewarding to kind of have that feeling of interest over there from the population kind of in general. You know, it's like, that's re that's really refreshing and rewarding because, you know, people are, are kind of checking it out no matter what. You know, they might just go to the shows because they want to have an experience. They're, they're open to the experience. And that's really exciting. The jazz audience over there is, is, a, is another thing too. You know, it's like you know, maybe more more concentrated than in the States in certain ways. It's nice. It's really nice to have that support for the art. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. let's talk let's talk about something that's more immediate in your career. You just released 2015's Relative Resonance. Give me an idea about this album and the creative forces that went in to go to release this album. Yeah, that, that project goes back a, a long time. Uh, for, well, a long time for me, but, uh, you know, kind of. It's like maybe we started 2011 playing in Brooklyn, and that's kind of along along the lines when I <clears throat> I moved to New York in 2008. So a lot of these projects that I'm finally kind of starting to deal with on a, like, I don't want to say production, but just kind of like realization kind of scheme, this is one of those. So it, it, it's been a long time coming. The same thing with the Deer Girl Band, you know, like I... I was playing with those guys in Baltimore, you know, many years before I moved to New York. You know, Relative Resonance was kind of, it. I just, for me, I really work, like, in cycles when it's time for something to really happen. I kind of, I really kind of feel it. So it. Mostly artistically, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm, I, I feel, you know, convinced 
I convince myself enough that it's that it's time to like really show something, or yeah. it's, you know, it's ready. It's ready. So that band, you know, I was trying a lot of music with over the years and experimenting, and finally, I kind of came up with something that I was ready and and just kind of knew what I wanted to do. And so that so the record is kind of it's a product of of that process, which I'm pretty happy with that it that, that it exists. So. We also recorded a, another one back in January already. We did a live record uh, in New York City at Greenwich House Music School, and that has a like a bunch of video and it's a live recording. So that will be released in the fall as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. The music is very similar, but since it's live, it you know you can kind of you can experience it in a very different way because just the nature of the creativity and the improvising and you know. Jazz, basically. So absolutely I'm excited absolutely. for that. Yeah, very cool. Let me get an idea of where were you born and raised. I'm from uh, the state of Maine. I was born in Portland, Maine, okay. and um, yeah, raised up there. My parents are both pretty, you know, full time hardcore Mainers, not from Massachusetts or something like that. That's a, that's like kind of a local thing up there. But yeah, so Maine all the way. And then uh, moved down to Baltimore and went to school down there, and then I moved from there to uh, to Washington Heights, New York City, to Manhattan. What What was it about your childhood that got you interested in jazz? When did that happen for you? Was it an album, or what What happened? Right. I mean, basically, for me, the way things worked was I, I got really interested in music really early on, just through family, through friends. Through sound is basically how I I explain it because you know up there it's really quiet and for the most part you can really hear and making making sound in general is like for, for me was very um it, it sticks out a lot you know like if it's some like backwoods chainsaw making crazy high end vibrations or if it's like a, a marimba playing next door from your neighbor that you can hear half of the octaves. So any, anyway, like music in general, and then um, there's this really great camp up there called the Main Jazz Camp. And long story short, is, you know, it's all New York-based musicians that are the teachers over the years, and it's been happening for a long time. So it was kind of like a mix of me and my friends being really into music and checking out new things and looking towards Boston and, you know, kind of making these connections between what we knew, like kind of funk music and then into like kind of jam bands and then kind of into jazz and then deeper and deeper digging into it. It was a mix of that plus the faculty, which are, you know, names that everybody knows kind of in creative music scenes like Tony Malaby and Reza Bazi and, you know, David Berkman and, you know, just kind of all over the spectrum of these guys doing this teaching gig and kind of hearing what they were checking out and starting to just dig deeper and deeper into jazz is really that's that's the answer. So I'm happy for that by the way. Really lucky to have that experience. Absolutely. Grateful for that. Very grateful for that. So talk to me about that first drum kit you got when you were seven. <laughs> yeah. This is the same the same along the same lines, you know, it's just like I I heard the sound. I mean, I think maybe I was even younger. I was like <laughs> Sorry, guys, cutting stuff on the sidewalk. <laughs> um, you know, it was like I wanted that sound. I, I think I heard like a neighbor. I, I had a neighbor that was playing in bands, um, and he was practicing. He was kind of like this metal drummer, actually really, really good, kind of, you know, coming out of the 80s thing, really technically kind of amazing. So drums I, were kind of in the air. You know, I just wanted I wanted that sound, and finally my parents – I bugged them, bugged them, and they got got me a kit, and it was just kind of just me in a room for a lot of years, just figuring it out on my own. They, they weren't, they just kind of let me do whatever. They weren't really, you know, they weren't forcing me to take lessons or practice. Just kind of let me deal, and, and I kind of came up with my own thing, and then eventually started studying, and ended up obviously studying a lot, so and being really into it. So it was pretty or, organic, which I'm also very very grateful for that. That part of the earlier stages, that process, was, um, was, I, I think, very helpful, actually, in a certain way, musically. So, 
Sure. Well, and from an yeah. early age, too, you, you got to learn from vocalist Cleo Lane and with uh, Christian McBride. What were those experiences like that young in your life? Yeah, I mean, over the years, there's been a lot of those types of things. That that was really early, too. That was, gosh, that must have been, yeah, I mean, you know, so seeing Christian McBride in person, meeting him, playing with him even a little bit, kind of just like workshoppy things, but being around that energy was very eye-opening, you know, culturally and musically. You know, we were checking out his records and then kind of kind of seeing him, you know, seeing the whole thing in real life changes it. Also, like, there, there's, like, jazz gigs coming through Maine. There's this guy named Paul Lichter who's pretty pretty established. You know, a lot of musicians on the East Coast and in the, in the scene kind of know him. And he'd be bringing tons of people up. So, you know, it was kind of a combination of influences at the same time at an early age that was really helpful. And then you move on to the Peabody Conservatory at John Hopkins in Baltimore. Talk to me about that formal education. You've had a lot yeah. of education out live in the field, but in a classroom environment, what did you learn? What, what was that like? That, you know, I when I think about these school situations, yeah, th- that experience was actually really, really great. It, it was kind of... Also, I feel very fortunate about all, all of the things that have happened, including right now, even talking with you, it's just like like very positive feeding into the music. So, like the, the education at Peabody, I mean, if I, you know, if I make a statement very kind of simply put, was was really real. It was really like I was super lucky to be around people, like the teachers that were there, at that time in the school because a lot of schools have super established programs and this was this was just kind of getting going um the head of the program uh then and still now is uh, gary thomas saxophone flautist gary thomas and um michael formanek is also there and doing lots of stuff and uh you know ingrid jensen was there so basically just like especially the way that gary the amount of experience that he has as a player and as an artist and like, you know, the way he operates at that time, it was just really special to be around that energy. You know, it's kind of, kind of loose, you know, very informative and like very real, like I'm saying. So I, I just got a ton out of that because I was around those guys a lot. It wasn't like classroom, classroom only. It was kind of like, this is, you want to make music? This is here. Like, like a pretty real offering from those guys, which I have a lot of gratitude, uh, a lot of gratitude for. Again, I feel very lucky that that that, uh, that I happened to be around at that time, you know, during those days. That's kind of that education, you know, aside from the formal, like, you know, Western classical, you know, it was kind of like the jazz side of the school, uh, which was really deep. And then it was also like the classical side kind of colliding, which was also great to be around, you know, like pretty, really, actually not pretty, very heavy classical musicians, very highly trained, accomplished performers. So it was, you know, kind of seeing like a jazz person at a very high level and then looking over and seeing like, you know, some of these super heavy concert pianists like Leon Fleischer or something, you know, even more down the line. But, you know, it was like a lot of inspiration going on at once is is that experience. Well, then after Peabody, yeah. you go to the Band Center for the International Jazz and Creative Music Workshop, headed by Dave Douglas in Alberta. What was that experience like? There, I mean, you had, you know, Gerald Cleaver, Clarence Penn. You had a lot of action going on there after college. So what was that like? It's all the same in terms of, like, blending. Again, I, I'm so, I was so fortunate. Like, like I, I think I missed, like, the college graduation because I was in Europe on a tour. And, like... Uh, you know, just like things just keep running into each other. And then I went out to Canada and Formanek and Gerald made this connection and uh, like uh, in Baltimore. And like, so, you know, Gerald and I started hanging out. That's where him and I really became friends. And like, um, you know, Osby was there and he used to teach at Peabody. So it's like all these musical connections and, and personal and artistic connections just kept rolling around. You know, so the Banff was Banff was really great for me just because, you know, you meet so many cool people from all over. It's very international. It's kind of, it was kind of like jazz school, but less formal and, and more real and cooler. 
you know, and people were just making music nonstop, and I was really into that. I'm still really into that, but, like, the time, you know, you could do, like, six sessions in one day with, with like, tons of people, and just, I mean, just the amount of music that was being made is, it is like astounding at that place. So it, it, you know, the, the word hotbed is definitely, you know, for real. It's like tons of inspiration, you know, from all over the place. Dave Douglas is teaching composition. Greg Osby is talking about record industry and everything else. And like, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's very cool. It's very positive. I, I highly recommend that. I kind of, you know, told some other people, like they were coming from Baltimore. I said, you, you know, you got to do this and go, go have this experience. Definitely worth it. So that was Banff. And then immediately after that, I moved to New York. So it was like kind of been non stop. <laughs> yeah, fast track. So let's segue from the formal education in the classroom to the real world. You played with Garzone, Sam Rivers, Ted Rosenthal, mm-hmm. Ingrid Jensen, you mentioned. Uh-huh. What, what's it been like to be around people that have been so seasoned and journeyed in the jazz arts and to be next to that so fast in a place like New York? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, I feel it's like sounding super old already to me, but I, I just have to say it because it's, you know, I don't want to use the word blessed, hashtag blessed, but it's really like, <laughs> it's really um, very fortunate to be a part of this community. I mean, when I think about jazz, music and you know you look at the history and you look at the people it's really about the hang it's really about the people getting together and playing and like unifying over this music and experimenting and and you know it's that energy and that kind of lifestyle and you know being around more of that of people that are older than you that have done a lot have experienced a lot is just always a really special thing like I mean Ingrid was mostly in Baltimore we played a little bit in New York but like just her whole perspectives on her life and the way she operates is is really deep you know playing gigs with her is like it, it's a whole it was really informative you know trying original music with her is like you know just all these things you know it's been very uh very informative um either academia or real life I mean most, you know, the the real stuff is happening mostly on the gigs, you know, like in, in sessions in New York, at least for me, you know, getting together with these, with all sorts of people, people being very cool and very open to like making music often. And that, that to me is why I'm in New York, because that's, that's what I'm after, you know, I'm after experimentation, I'm after openness, I'm after you know, unknowns, all, all of these types of things. You know, you've had a lot of great teachers, as, as we've talked about over this interview so far. Mm. Is there one teacher in particular where their words kind of roil around in your head on a regular basis? Not your favorite, but someone that really laid some <laughs> foundations for you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't, yeah, it's like going to be picking favorites from, from people from the past and, and current. You know, not to, like, get all heady and everything, but, you know, it's like the teachers are you know it's like we're all we're all kind of teachers even you know the more you get away from school and institutions I feel like I was really lucky to get away you know to step away from those but to take all of the good stuff and keep that I would say like maybe a lot of things that that uh, saxophonist Gary Thomas said and the way he operates w- was really really kind of special like you know, just like the influence of being around Miles, you know, and like in, in dealing with somebody like that. And then for me to be not, not that he's, you know, he, you know, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to say what he is or anything, but like everything gets passed down in life and, and influences and all that. And so to be around somebody with those types of experiences can be <laughs> really refreshing because a lot of people kind of aren't aren't able to get that and I don't mean directly with someone you know him but just just people that have been fortunate to to play a lot of music is really what I'm talking about at the end of the day I realized the other day as well that that like I've been around Gary and Dave Liebman and they're they were both around Miles a lot so it's it's like and that just was kind of happening with saxophone players I think I really like playing with saxophones you know so that's as a drummer so um it's it's just a part of their lineage. It's very, 
very special to me. So that's great. That's an interesting way of putting it. Everybody, we are we are as good as the shoulders we stand on, and this entire craft yeah. is full of historical figures that everybody's kind of had their art kind of run into, and it only helps everybody else that comes behind them, so to speak. So totally, it's it's a lineage thing, and that's why music is the music is so great with with people because there's so much it's it's love in the air and you know people are so into music the musicians and and it has to be that positivity and that that forward energy or else you know you start looking at you know not as inspirational things like like oh i don't i don't i don't even want to say money but just you know different you know the other things that are going on in the world and that, that maybe aren't as uh positive i think this music is very a very very positive thing on on so many levels for for society for people to be aware of you know what how it works and and what musicians are thinking within this system i recently watched a Wynton marcellus interview and he was it was in the uk and he was kind of talking i'm about to go to the uk as well but he was kind of talking about how the music i don't want to say functions but you know he he's kind of just talking about the vibe of the music and perspectives, American perspectives in the international sense. And that, that, was, that was a pretty, pretty interesting interview without me saying too much of what he's saying. Sorry, I'm in Chinatown right now. <laughs> oh, no. I did want to kind of bring something up that's interesting. You know, a lot of people, you really only understand certain things when you get a historical perspective. And I ran into a couple of guys locally that were kind of imposters to the Blues Brothers. And I kind of said to them, you know, jazz came from the blues, you know, and they were like, what are you talking about? And I was like, that was the precursor to what we know as jazz. And they were like, you, I, they couldn't believe it. And it's funny how people historically don't understand where the origins of things begin, because a lot of people think it was jazz, then it was blues, but it was the other way around, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, to me, checking out, the, you know, there's been some interesting shows, um, you know, um, like on Netflix about American music perspectives. But then there's been these like Muscle Shoals things talking about kind of like the, the Motown records in the 60s. And I really am interested in those because it's giving a perspective on how American music has formed. And yes. I'm kind of waiting for somebody to do that with exactly what you're talking about, more, like more in depth, like about even deeper into the roots of blues and like, and, and especially between the line between blues and jazz and kind of the Dixie stuff and how it early, you know, the earlier roots of it. I mean, as a modern player, you know, people, I'm pretty sure that or at least the way I operate is like, try to know as much as you possibly can. Like that openness to like knowing more about Louis Armstrong and the hot five at that period at the same time as checking out, like, you know, Cage's mid to later work or something like that and, and blending them to, like, to being, like, bringing it to 2016 instead of leaving it in 1959 and going, oh, yeah, well, that, you know, that's, that's what that is. You know, to me, that's not really kind of what modernism is or modern jazz. I mean, people can, people can do whatever they want, and everybody is, and it's awesome. But, um, you know, I just, I like, my thing is kind of using all of the history. So, you know, yeah, I think people, uh, people need to investigate more of everything, you know, doing research. That's, that's maybe a thing that sticks in my mind is like Greg Osby talking about a lot, like really like checking out the history and being cool with it and having that inform your decision. I think yeah. that's really important for me. So, you know, the history of jazz is not that big, so it's, it's pretty manageable at this point for people to be yeah. looking at, I think, a lot of it. You know. Anyway, with that's a rant. No, 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 that's totally cool. So let me, yeah. let me kind of get back on to, we were just talking about your teachers, and you're a teacher yourself, so what's your philosophy with your students? I, I teach quite often. My philosophy, well, I would say that my students are kind of, well, whatever. I have a, I have a wide range of teams that a lot of people do. I try and just kind of keep things loose and let them do what they want to do and try to push them more towards that and elevate that. So, like, you know, some of my students, I've got an older student who, like, doesn't, doesn't really want to do jazz, so I don't really force him 
but over the years he's been kind of like, oh, maybe I, maybe I do. So I'm kind of like slowly like, I, like undercover kind of like feeding him the, the like you know just examples and kind of trying to get him interested in kind of in, in as organic of a way as I can that's not like gonna annoy people because I I feel like if you come at people immediately with like you know, like, oh, you got to check out Philly Joe Jones and, like, you know, which you do. But, you know, a lot of people aren't, younger people aren't naturally gravitating to that. So it's it's really a part of the process just as much as the music. So I, I guess I guess I'm just trying to kind of extend that into um, ways of learning, you know. I, Absolutely. The other thing was, I, I, yeah, I also studied with uh, John Riley at Manhattan School of Music. So that was also a completely different perspective from undergrad and that was also really eye opening. He's an amazing educator and extremely informative in, in, in uh jazz everything, history, you know, etc drumming, et cetera. Like like really special. So that that's also a nice influence for me but in, in terms of education. Let me ask you this, from a jazz drum perspective, who who influenced you the most? I think one thing that I've learned since being in New York is kind of this music is is kind of who's around, you know, who who are you around, who do you want to be around, you know, like the type of people that you're around naturally. And, um, you know, Gerald Cleaver has been a huge influence for me, mainly because he's, you know, in town and, and playing around and, like, accessible and super cool and, like, keeping the music really real. So that's that's been a big – he's been a big influence – as a musician and a drummer, obviously, both of those. At the moment, that's kind of like all that's coming to my mind sure. <laughs> right now. But, I'm, you know, there's, there's so many people that uh, I'm sure I'm facing on right, right now. But, yeah, it's like how often can you see people play that are playing a lot, that are open to sharing and talking? I mean, we're, we're like, still talking all the time about cymbal cases and, like you know, just totally geeking out about, about drumming still and rudiments and you know it's just a, another connection into into music. I mean, people's the thing that I really like about New York is people are really serious about making music here on on in whatever ways that they're doing it. If it's like some stuff avant punk like underground crazy stuff happening in Bushwick that I think more people should check out, or if it's like going to the Jazz Standard and watching <clears throat> you know like whatever group is happens to be playing, you know, I can name 10 or whatever, but, and they're all good. And I like to kind of swing between all of the, the, uh, spectrums because I'm, I'm, that's like where my interests truly lie. It's, it's not just doing one thing really, really well and kind of calling it a day. I mean, I, I would like to think that people that are making statements are really digging pretty, pretty deep, like as, as deep as possible to uh to create their art. And I you know, a lot of the inspiration that, that we look at, a lot of the jazz figures did that, you know, it's like but maybe people aren't talking about it in those terms. I I don't know. Maybe I'm totally off. Maybe I'm in my own world. I too much no. I don't know. It's hard no, to keep so, up. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand man. No, it's all good. So cool. let let me get a little nostalgic here. Let's say, you know, you're walking around New York City right now. You walk down into the subway and you got a magic subway. And you could go anywhere in that city historically and see a jazz show. Who, where are you going to go? Who do you want to see? It, it will vary. Like last night, Le Poisson Rouge was, there was a nice concert there. Um, tonight, uh, maybe Conception concert series in Brooklyn. Well, I'm flying out Thursday, so that <laughs> rules that. Uh, okay. Wednesday, uh, last week I went to the Vanguard. The week before I went to the Vanguard, so I'm, uh, Bill Fazell and Thomas Morgan, and the week before was Myra Metzler. You know, just, there, there's so much music here that, that's on, on such a high level. It's such a great place to experience music, and there's a lot of people here for that exact reason, which is really nice. So, you know, venues, old and new, um, again, it's about the people, you know, and, and, and the music and just kind of being around soaking it up really still i've been here 10 years almost 10 years coming up on 10 years and i'm like i can't imagine really you know i, I kind of flirt with berlin as my other city i got a drum set there as well but uh <laughs> the amount of amazingness happening here is just overwhelming 
is, is yeah. really the truth. Absolutely. The truth from my angle, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. So yeah. let me ask you this. Why do you love jazz? Well, the simple answer would be kind of freedom, but also freedom of expression, feeling, uh, freedom of, of, uh, of feeling is, is almost, I think, the best way for me to describe it. Um, you know, just being able to, like, make statements often and wanting to and, you know, all the things that come with that risk, risk is a big side of it for me. You know, for me personally, I know I know there's a lot of people out there that might <clears throat> not really explore that too much, but uh, you know, it, it's very personal, which is another you know huge part of it, as everybody knows. I'm like talking on here's an interview, people are gonna be listening to me like, what is he talking about? But, <laughs> but you know, it's true, it's true. Every everybody, I think all the musicians that I'm around would would agree with that. You know, it's like very, um, it's a very special way to make music especially this history that we have in in this country that kind of it's it's uh it's it's lucky we're lucky to have this um body of work in the past and also to have the ingenuity i think that a lot of people have here to to uh, keep it going forward which i see all the time which is really, really inspirational all yeah. over the map too you know all sure all different styles yeah that's so, awesome that's, beautiful. that's why i like jazz <laughs> yeah yeah no that's cool my final question to you is this. Everybody yeah. has a version. They have a perception of who you are. Your your family does, your friends, uh-huh. your business associates, you the fans uh-huh. you play for. But who do you think you are? Uh, uh, who do you think you are? Who do you think who do you, you are? Think, uh, <laughs> that's a fun question. Um, I'm, not, I'm a sound maker, you know, and I like to make creative sounds. That's kind of who I am. I like to – I love working with people, like a lot of different people. I love ruining stereotypes of people that, you know, not of people, but of, you know, styles kind of going hardcore opposite of what you think it is. I'm going to go, oh, cool. Oh, great. Great. That's what you think this is. Okay, cool. Check this out. Like, this is actually what I'm doing now. And kind of like, you know, why do people have to pigeonhole, you know, people love putting boxes around everything because that's what sells and that's what makes the world go around. And, you know, part of my artistry is just, not doing that because why not? I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to say what things have to be or, you know, I don't want to always have to define everything that happens. So that with a mixture of being a sound maker is kind of how I think about a lot of things, you know. Perfect. <laughs> That's great, man. Cool. That's, that's a, it's a great thing, great way to wrap everything up. Devin, thank you for giving me some of your time. Good luck in Europe and keep making that great jazz, man. Awesome. Thanks so much. Good luck with the show and everything, and I'll be keeping an eye on you. It looks great. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Devin for his passion, his music, and that jazz story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can visit the neonjazz.blog spot.com for all things neon jazz until next time enjoy the music my friends neon jazz